So today, though, I want to share with you for a few minutes on something that I see happening across this country and really around the world. And the title of this message is Just Do It. And of course, we're focusing in on women, and really it's for all of us in many respects, but I am thinking of women, and it takes me to a scripture in John 2, 1 through 11. You can read the story later. I think it's one of the uh, stories that I, I've preached about from different aspects over the years, and Sandra even got to the point where she says, I don't want to... I don't want you to hear that being preached again, <laughs> but hey, you know, in fact, this past week, one of our social media team that are movers and shakers, and that we'd just flown into the city, and, and they asked me, so, well, who's preaching on Sunday? I said, well, does one of you want to do it? And, and I didn't get any volunteers. <laughs> You know, I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not selfish. I'm glad to share the wealth here. <laughs> you know, you want to preach? And they, 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 didn't, they didn't respond. They just kind of looked at me like cattle at a gate, you know, just a vacant expression. I said, well, I guess that means I'm preaching. And, uh, but one of them will remain nameless, even though sitting on the second row there said to me, had the audacity to say to her pastor, knowing how sensitive I am, <laughs> said, well, pastor, you do know that this is Mother's Day, so whatever you do, please don't preach on sports. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> or, or, or on construction. <laughs> Or tractors, or yeah. You know. But don't, don't, don't. Whatever you do, don't preach on sports. And I, being agreeable, said, "Yes, that's right. Don't, don't worry. I'm a very intelligent person. I, 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 I realize that. So I went before God <laughs> and God said, "Just do it." <laughs> so. Don't put this on me. Put this on Jesus and his perspective. But you remember a number of years ago, uh, for those of you that have been around a while, when the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in regards to Title IX and ruled that the way things were set up within the nation as far as monies going out to sports that women were being shortchanged, like a thousand to one, <laughs> okay? I mean, major shortchanged. And I'll be perfectly honest, my initial reaction, because I read what they were going to do and they were going to divide this money equally, I said, no way. I said, who is interested in watching women football you know, or women basketball or women whatever? Other I mean, I like women playing volleyball. I think it's cool, okay? And, <laughs> and I, I love women's softball. I th I'm just like phenomenal seeing uh, young ladies swing and throw that big softball. I, I think it's amazing. I think it's very cool. But other than that, I couldn't conceive, conceptualize the idea of, of giving equal amounts of money to women over sports when nobody wanted to watch it was my attitude. I'm just being honest. But I have come to realize how very important it is to recognize that women are equal partners in this life. And we have to respect them. We have to respect ourselves by respecting women. And that they have an equal place within our society. And that's what led me to this message was because I was hearing these things out there. And please let me preface it by saying, uh, I'm not in the business 
I mean, my mom and my father taught me early on, more so my mother than my father, because my father had some, uh, I don't know if you understand this word or not, but colloquialisms, some uh, sayings from back in the day that didn't fully make sense to me. But somehow I knew mm, maybe it's not so cool. But my mother would always give me a look if I disrespected other people. And so I was taught early on that I needed to respect all people, whatever their background, no matter how different they were from our family. They came from different backgrounds. I can remember, side note, it's not, not in my message, but I can remember in the third grade, okay, way back at dark ages, third grade, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with a bunch of Norwegians and Swedes and Finns. You know what a Finn is? Finnish people. And we all talk like this, you know. No, that sounded kind of Mexican there. No, 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 no. I've been here too long, but now, yeah, I come from Minnesota, and that's the way they talk. So, at any rate, I remember uh, Harrison Elementary School. This sounds bizarre. I get it, but we were very isolated back then in Minnesota, and I can remember the first. African American child coming into our third grade class. And it was very unusual. And bless his heart, <laughs> he was like this phenomenon, <laughs> you know, because it was so different. He didn't have blonde hair. <laughs> And it was so unique, but I can remember, even back then, I guess that pastoral call was on my life because my Mrs. King came to me, took me aside, said, Norman, I want you to help Eddie to feel part of our class. And I took it serious. It mattered to me. And so that was my project, not that I knew anything or I had no clue, except I was inviting him to my house to play and just trying to be normal for whatever normal is. But from the youngest of age, that was important to me. So I, I do not accept the idea of putting anyone down, no matter their background, no matter their sexuality, no matter their political background, yada, yada, yada. That's Jewish, by the way, yada, yada, yada. Uh, that means like, yeah, whatever. Uh, I, it, that's important. I was taught that from early age. So what I'm about to share with you, that does not mean we can take this and go, yeah, Pastor, I don't, I don't want you taking that attitude like let, let's lynch these people or let's, let's abuse other people. In World War II, uh, we would draw, I'm not quite that old, but in World, I'm talking about us as a people here in America, we would draw pictures of the Japanese people and we would exaggerate their faces because they were the enemy. And I get it. I understand it that, that these things happen in war. But it was not a good thing because those were just people as well. And so how people look or what their backgrounds are, I, am, I'm, I want to be respectful towards all people. I am not out to get anyone. I believe in certain things, and I believe in the freedom to say, no, I don't agree with that. And it does not necessarily make me homophobic, racist, or whatever. It just, I believe certain principles that are absolute, and endeavor to live that out in my own life but that doesn't mean I force myself on others. But it does mean that 
as I want to be respected, I respect others as well. So, long story short, here we go. John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus' mother was invited to a party, and Jesus came along, along with his disciples. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. She didn't tell him what to do, but because of the mother-son relationship, that was so tight and so close, she didn't have to spell it out. My father would spell it out. And, you know, he would make it very clear. And that's just the way it was. But my mother just had to give me a look. And it was like the look of, oh, my God. <laughs> okay. And I would back off or keep my mouth shut, or whatever I was doing to stop it. And here, Mary just turns to her son and says, they're running out of wine. And his response was, woman, I mean, they must have had a close relationship. You know. <laughs> woman, What does that have? He clearly says it. He says, what does that have to do with me? You know, I'm here for the party. If they, you know, I'm, now I'm extrapolating, but if they didn't bring enough wine, that's not my fault. What does that have to do with me? Why should I get involved? You ever say that, but then your mother gives you that look? <sighs> Yeah, and when they give you that look, she doesn't need to, it's already spelled out. In other words, you need to do something about this. And he even, he even tried to say, my time hasn't come yet. In other words, you know, I haven't started. I mean, they, she knew what was coming down to a certain degree, but she was like, I don't care. I'm your mother. I'm going to give you that look anyway. So now it's up to you. And because he was an obedient son, even though this was not yet his time, but yet it was, I mean, the father knew. The father knew that really it was the time. And so we had the very first miracle of Jesus. And it was for a party, for goodness sakes. It was for a celebration. It wasn't to heal the lepers. It wasn't to part the Red Sea. It was for a party. And so she automatically, knowing that he was going to be an obedient son, I mean, this, he was submitting himself to her. You know, this was God submitting himself to this little woman. A woman in a society where women were treated like cattle. In a society where women were treated second class, they did, I mean, forget voting rights, I mean, or property rights. I mean, if you got married, if you did have any property, boom, automatically went to the man. But here they were. And she turns to the servants at the party with authority. And she says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Just do it. And so he proceeds out of obedience, submission, mutually. I mean, uh, hello, when we're married or we're in a family, we're to be mutually submitted one towards another. I mean, your well-being is my well-being. When you get honored, I am honored 
by your being honored. And so Jesus, he doesn't argue, doesn't say a word. He just gets up and tells the servants to fill these big water pots with water. And he blessed it. And they said, give it. Pour some out to the, to the uh, what was called, the, the head of the party, the, the honored principal guest, the ruler that was there. And so they poured it out, and of course, we know the story that it had turned from water to wine, but not just any wine. All of a sudden, it was the best wine, and even the, the, the leader, the dignitary in the party said, Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> it's good insight into people's way and approach of living. It says, usually you give the best wine at the beginning of the party. Why would you do that? Because afterwards, there's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a buzz going on. Hello? Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, and you could give the cheap stuff later, and it really wouldn't matter because <laughs> they wouldn't care at that point. But he said, you saved the best wine for last. Now, that message can be taken many different directions, but for me, what really mattered was the fact that even Jesus was willing to listen to a woman. Hello? <laughs> Emma, yeah, clap. Oh, come on. Gentlemen, really clap. You got to be able to listen to a woman. You could stay out of so much trouble. I, I am very comfortable being a man. I thank God he made me a man. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I can get ready in 20 minutes and... <laughs> I used to gripe at Sandra. I said, why does it take you so long in the shower? Don't you realize we got to get going? You know, I mean, I can remember in high school. This has nothing to do with the message. In high school, playing on the football team, and we were given these two minutes. You were literally given two minutes to bathe. Uh, you know, and it was all about... The, the stopwatch, it, it, it's like you had two minutes to shower and, and get dressed to go to your next class, you know, after PE or football practice or whatever. And so I took great pride in beating the clock. I mean, I do that when I drive, you know, I, we're going to be at mile marker 27, uh, X amount of time. You know, everything to me is about timing and, and, and all that. It's very, very male. But it, Julie got mad at me one time. Put a timer on you. <laughs> I didn't put a timer on your shower, but I did clock you. I said, it took 22 minutes in that shower, just the shower portion. You know, and it was beyond me. And I, somehow I expressed this to Julie. She said, Pastor, you can't do that to your wife. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> But women have a voice, and that voice should be listened to. Now, I know we're going to focus in on mothers, but I'm talking about women in general. We are joint heirs, and as we come together to get here in this place, we are coming together as sons and daughters of the Most High God, and we are equally, properly, yoked together, and I have a phenomenal wife with whom I'm in a covenant relationship, but there are many women in my life that are a strong influence on me, and I listen to their voice. I listen to what they have to say, and yes, they approach it so differently than me, and sometimes it's like, ah, you like a different language, oh, and I have to but I have learned to speak their language. That's why we need to be bilingual. <laughs> Seriously, bilingual spiritually and in dealing with the fairer sex, 
we have to learn to be able to understand, not just he hear the words, but hear what's behind the words. Because I did not marry a woman to turn her into a man. Hallelujah. I want her to be the unique expression that she is. But we marry someone, and this is true going both ways. Hello? We marry someone, and then we try to turn them into us. We marry someone wanting them to be different than us because somehow we are not complete. Hello? And we need each other. Enough said. I think you get the idea. But here you have a situation where she is saying, whatever he says to do, do it. She was being in a role of leadership in a time when the leadership of women, they were on the very bottom of the ladder. I mean, forget glass ceilings. They were, I mean, they, were, they couldn't hardly even look up. You know, you just stay barefoot and pregnant and, and uh, get the meals there. But you know what? I would venture to say that today, and I, I, honestly, I have absolutely no qualms. I, mean, I tell Pastor Sandra, I've always told her this from the beginning. I said, honey, you want to work, you want to do, you can do. But if you decide you want to stay home and eat chocolate and do your nails, I signed on for this, I will provide for you. That's what a man does. Amen? Yeah. Now, having said that, I've never put limits on her. And I think it's a terrible, terrible mistake Usually that happens only with men who are very insecure. The most insecure men are going to be very uptight about the woman. I mean, I've known families where the, the woman earns more than the man. Yeah, I can think of one precious family. You know, and he, he really became Mr. Mom because it was much more practical, much more productive because she could bring it in boatloads of money, <laughs> and I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> yes, I will pick the kids up from school, no problem. <laughs> I will do our daughter's hair in the morning. I don't care. It's the most productive, practical thing to do. So if you are a secure human being, if you are a secure man, you are not intimidated or should not be by how successful your partner, your wife, can become. And we should have that attitude across the board within society that there are no barriers there to how far a woman can go because we do not live in the dark ages. I mean, I, I, I see phenomenon occurring today at both ends of the spectrum. Here's where it's going to get a little sensitive. Both ends of the spectrum. But this, I'm, I'm just a simple guy. I'm sorry. But when I see a man, biological man, promoting and selling sports bras, wearing them as a woman, and seeing biological men be promoted as woman of the year. Not only is that sick, and I don't mean that in the 21st century form of sick. I mean, it is pitiful that women are so being so relegated that even in Title IX, now, all of a sudden, you can have some guy that, and again, this is not a political message. I'm just, this is what's happening all around us right now. You can see a guy that's rated uh, number 200 among men in the, uh, across the country in XYZ sport. 
And all of a sudden, he decides he's going to be a, a woman. He's going to identify as a woman. And all of a sudden, he becomes number one in, in sport. And you've got all these women that worked so hard to achieve and be where they are. And this person, I won't call him a guy or a girl, that's up to the government and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this human being who was built in a certain way, and I don't care how much uh, testosterone you try to re remove an estrogen you try to put in. Their muscles are longer, their bones are longer, and they are simply going to physically outshine the women. It's just a physical, scientific fact. So we live in that kind of society today, and it's like we are disrespecting women. This is the most horrible disrespect for women that has occurred, and I never would have dreamed it. I mean, we're all just kind of like trying to figure our way through this, like, oh, my God. Even in the last few weeks, it's gotten so crazy that there are even transvestites, drag queens. I heard a drag queen the other day said, this is not right. It's gone too far. This person, again, I don't know if it's called male, whatever, this person said, I hate to admit it. I hate to admit it, but there really is a slippery slope. And we are going down this slippery slope where you can't identify what or who we are or what pronoun to use. Is this dangerous within a society to have this kind of experiment? We are experimenting with human beings, and what's really horrible is with our children, that you would have them go to public libraries or school libraries to have a drag show? My God, my God, my God. What are we allowing in this world? And ultimately, I say, this is a disrespect to women. How is this possible? And again, I don't mock anyone with the challenges they might face with their identity. And I really have little opinion, except for that which, for which I am responsible. And so I try to respect all people, regardless of their background, I mean, political divide, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something deeply wrong. And then you see the religious community. My wife has been preaching for, I don't know, let's see, since the beginning of time now. <laughs> since Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States. Hello? Or maybe Harry Truman, I don't know. I mean, no, Dwight, Dwight. I like Ike. That was his slogan. First president I could remember a slogan from politics, I like Ike. And uh, she's been preaching that long. She has never really cared one way or the other what kind of title you want to give her. But you know what? If it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. <laughs> It's probably a duck. <laughs> she has always maintained her femininity. She's never tried to act butchy, shall we say? Uh, is that an acceptable word? I don't know. She never tried to act like. Uh, she is the epitome of, I feel like a woman. And uh, I thank God for it. I, I wouldn't have married her because I'm too much of a guy. And I'm so thankful for that. But that did not limit her 
to obeying what God told her to do. And God gave a message in her heart, and she shared it. She would go to churches where they, they couldn't quite figure it out, and they'd say, well, we have a, someone coming tonight who's going to give their testimony. <laughs> and she didn't care. And so she'd give her testimony for two weeks straight, night after night, because they couldn't handle saying what well, she was going to preach. She didn't care what they called her. She just had to fulfill the mandate that God had given her life. She didn't care what people thought when she founded a seminary in Mexico. She didn't care. I mean, nobody cared. When she and her mom went into the garbage dumps in Monterey, no one cared what you called it that the church, first church they built also included showers because the people there were the blind, the beggars, the cripples, street people, prostitutes. She didn't care what title it was. She just knew that there was a need. And she fulfilled the mandate that God gave to her of just do it. Just do it. And if ever there was an hour in which we need women to stand up and just do it, it's right now. I, I, I appreciate men, but sorry, guys, we haven't exactly done a great job in leadership you know, some of the problems we have is because we didn't stand up and we're not the godly kind of men we're supposed to be. I look at, I look at numbers, you know, and I, I see, uh, you know, we, how many thousands of people we got on Facebook, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I look at the demographics from it. We'll do a promotion and 72% are, are females responding to us. Boom. And the rest are guys. Or I think they're guys. And uh, I just threw that in. I'm sorry. That was, that, that was not, that's not cool. <laughs> nah. <laughs> they're men. <laughs> but women, t by and large, tend to be more in touch with the spiritual aspect or side, and they're more involved in relationships than they are with men. To me, that I got things ready for you. I mean, you'll see me here at all kinds of odd hours, morning, noon, and night, because I want it just right. That, like, turns me on <laughs> to have it just right for you to be able to utilize and enjoy. But women are much, and, and, I, and I have to be kind of reminded that it's not about making sure that there's Kleenex there, but that's important. But making sure that I, hello, honey, that I look you in the eye <laughs> and listen to you because you are much more in tune with matters of the heart. And the, uh, the eyes or the window, the soul, is that what they said? And if I'm doing this, or I'm reading the newspaper, and I'm, she's in the background, and she's telling me this important thing, and I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no, no problem. And she stop, she'll just stop mid-sentence. Just when you're ready, and I, I, I get with them, then put the darn newspaper down and listen to me and look me in the eye. Because she has an authority that even moved Jesus. He didn't, she didn't need to say a word. She just told him what the problem was and then looked at him. And he said, yes, ma'am, whatever you want. So ladies, do not for our sake, for my sake, 
do not back down. Don't act like me. Don't try to be like me. I don't want that. But be the best you that you can be. But ultimately, it's not about how good we are at doing and being what we are. It's about all of us mutually submitting our hearts and lives to Jesus and following what he tells us to do. Because that's what she was saying to the service, is just do what he tells you to do. And she knew it would work out. And if we had more women who are willing to speak up today and say, just do what Jesus says to do, and it's going to work out. Your identity problems, your questions, legitimate questions, the way you were abandoned, and all of our different stories, we all have a story. And I get it, and it's very real. But if we would just listen and do what he tells us to do, then we can avoid so many of the things where society says, well, forget about that religious stuff. Let's do what is popular right now. That's why we're getting into so much trouble. So, you know, I mean, there's like one or two scriptures in the Bible that would, and it was about a very specific situation, a very specific church where they had this problem where the women would sit on one side. You know, there's churches like that even today. But the women would sit on one side and the men would sit on the other side. And the women were not educated. And so they would be asking their questions to their husbands who were sitting on the other side and said, Oye, viejo, no entiende. I don't understand this. You know, what's the deal? And, you know, so the Apostle Paul is responding to them saying, you know, women need to keep silent in church. Well, they carried that situational admonition and made it this big, huge doctrine out of it. And yet, when you look at the length, the depth, of the breadth of the freedom that Christ came to give all humankind, regardless of your background, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, he was the great revolutionary and the great equalizer in saying, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And there is now, therefore, no condemnation, because it was filled with condemnation, filled with this guilt. And that's what you see happening so often. But you go back, and the whole idea was, well, women are cursed. Well, you know what? If you go back to the very beginning, we were all cursed because of sin. Yes, there was a curse. And it was horrible because of our disobedience. It wasn't because of God's heart. But he treated us like his sons and daughters. Treated us as, as dignity, as royal priesthood. And walking together in the cool of the evening. Giving them the fruit. You, you name them. Whatever you want to call the zebra. Whatever you want to call the thing with the long neck or you know, whatever. It's up to you. Take dominion. We don't worship Mother Earth. The Earth is here because God made us to be sovereign over it. But the problem came when the curse came because of disobedience. And so, yes, there was a curse placed on men and women. The curse for men was, you know, I'm sorry, but you're going to work like a dog for the rest of your life. And there's going to be weeds everywhere. Boy, I tell you, isn't that the truth? As hard as you try to hoe, there's going to be more weeds. The weeds grow a whole lot faster than the good stuff. And that's just the reality of this world. And it is very, very hard. You work yourself to the bone. And women, you're going to be cursed. You're going to go through a pain that men... I don't care what they call themselves or wear bras or whatever. They aren't going to go through this pain. But you're going to give 
you're going to have pain in childbirth. And because of that womb, because of that difference, even, even in the natural, uh, I won't get off to a different direction. Oh, it's already let, past time, so I've got to come to the point. So I'll skip that. That was really good. <laughs> but you'll never know. <laughs> now, a womb, when in, in, in extremely cold weather, heat for a woman goes where? To their womb. Heat for a man goes to his hands because he's supposed to be out there doing whatever has to be done to cause survival. But for the woman, it's to protect that womb. Therefore, hallelujah, we come to Luke 1. Oh, I got to wrap this up. See, you didn't give me enough time. The Song of Mary. It was a long shower. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this, they, they even decided to call it the Song of Mary. I don't know that it was a song, but it's called the Song of Mary, where she preached. And she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. This, start, this starts out fine. It's acceptable from the right or to the left. It, was just, it starts out cool. But from the religious leaders, it was okay. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. The, the guys could go along with that. Yes, the lowly state of the maidservant. No problem. For behold, henceforth all generations. Now, here she's starting to turn. It says, for all generations will call me blessed. She was standing up for herself here and say, hey, <laughs> every generation is going to call me blessed because I received him into my heart and into my body. Into, he came forth as the Holy Spirit hovered over me. For he was regarded the low state of his measure. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and his holy name. But here she choop, turns it on its end, and she is teaching men. And his mercy is on those, go ahead, play, who fear him. From generation to generation. This was the message of a woman to humanity. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. She was giving an altar call. She was preaching. And the rich he has sent away empty. Like, you know, hey, hold on. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. It's all about Jesus in the end. It's not about you or me, but we are to be like Jesus. And as we fill our hearts with his presence, then I don't care what title they give you or don't give you. You continue to fight the good fight. You lead. You don't back down. You be the leader God has called you to be. You don't have to act like a man. You don't need to do that. But you do need to be filled with his word so that what you are saying is just do what he tells you to do. And when you speak that, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. I mean, I will elect you president. I don't think any of you are, at this point, uptight over it being a woman that gives you a diagnosis if it, it's going to help you to live. You don't say, well, oh, excuse me, but you're a woman. I, I, I can't listen to your diagnosis. Even though you have the qualifications as a scientist to speak the truth, to you in your moment of need. Women have not only equal rights, you know, 
men have a responsibility to honor them. Yes, they are the weaker sex, but they can bring forth life. And carry that life to term. And nurture and cover and protect in ways that we never could because we were not made to do so. Stand with me. We'll wrap this up. What a great honor it is for all of us to come together as one body. The Bible teaches, we don't live in the Old Testament. The New Testament teaches us there is neither male nor female in Christ. But we are one with him. And we have been freed from the curse. We have been freed from the curse. It doesn't have to be so hard for me anymore because I have Jesus in my heart and I can listen to him and he can tell me, son, with all due respect, go home and let it go. Son, let me guide you to a better way. I know where the big fish are. I know where the opportunities are that you can't pull off because of your strength. And women, you don't have to feel like you've got to manipulate because I, I get it. Guys are simple. I'm a, I'm a guy too. I, get, I, am, I am simple. You know, we're driving down the highway and she'll start talking about something serious. I say, please, be quiet. I, can't, I, I have only one focus. I can only do one thing at a time. I'm trying to get to our destination because I'm a guy. Thank you, Jesus. And I don't apologize for it. But we need each other. We need to be one. As we are mutually submitted one towards the other under the banner of the cross of Calvary. Oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy on our land. We just pray for our nation right now, our precious nation. Our precious nation in this world that is groaning with cataclysmic things happening. We're trying to find the right way. We can't go backwards. We don't want to go backwards. The good old days were not so good. Hello? There was bad things in back in the day. But the only answer is Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord Jesus, take these, your sons and daughters. And Lord, especially this day, help and bless each and every woman within the sound of my voice and online. Bless them, Lord. Lord, I pledge to be a good support system that every woman I am associated with can be who God has called them to be. And I will not limit them, but I will enable them to do and be the very best possible woman that they can be. And as I do that for them, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I will trust you that you will be my provider and my portion. Heal us, O oh God, as a church, as a family, and as servants of God. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching. Scan the QR code to get connected. We invite you to leave a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the notification button so you can know when our next video is here.